to the last presentation of LogicCon 2013. Uh, for this session, we have Hans Lankel um, talking to us about the radiometric dating, how it works, and why it matters. Hans Lankel was born and raised in Germany. He came to Canada in 1980 and got a PhD in geology from McGill University. Uh, from 1985 to 1987, he was a postdoc at Louisiana. And from 1987, he is a professor at the University of Alberta. <coughs> professor Lockwell's research deals mainly in carbon, carbonate, oil, and gas reservoirs. He has published more than 100 technical papers and one book on various subjects. He has given more than 150 presentations at international scientific meetings and received several awards for his scientific work. He has been teaching courses on various subjects at the 100 to 500 levels and the 100 to, 500, 100 to 200 level courses cover all aspects of Earth sciences from the origin of the universe via dinosaurs to global climate change. Please uh, join me in welcoming you. One other thing I need to mention, if you are recording this uh, video or audio um, and are planning to post it to the internet, please tag it with Logic On and uh, contact the organizers of the events Link everything together. All right. I, I prefer to use the link so I don't have to holler. Yeah. What on earth are you guys doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's 27 degrees up there. The first nice day since August last year. You here to listen to me? <laughs> I'm impressed. You can't hear me? I still have to speak up. Anyway, thanks for staying on. And I will, uh, I assure you, you won't regret uh, the next half hour or so. Now, when Mark asked me to give a talk on radiometric dating, I scratched my head and asked myself, why this particular topic? Little did he know that this is actually the centennial of the science of radiometric dating. I asked him 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, this is actually fortuitous, coincidental, call it whatever you want. But exactly a hundred years ago, this gentleman here published a book called The Age of the Earth, and it was the first time that numbers, hard, scientifically verifiable numbers, were put on the age of Earth. So there's actually quite a lot of celebrations going on in the geochemical uh, scientific communities about this event. I'd like to go back a little bit farther or further into the past to tell you where this is all coming from. Prior to about 1600 AD, there was the, what we philosophically historically call the pre-scientific era, and basically people, humankind, followed the Greek philosophers, and to some degree the Bible in the age of Earth was sort of about 6,000 years. Then we had a century that is called the era of cosmogenic speculations, when Bishop Usher proposed, based on his very thorough, diligent reading of the Bible, I have no idea how he did this, he proposed the creation of Earth was October 23, 4304 at nightfall. <coughs> of course, that's complete nonsense, but for some reason, if you have authority, people believe that for about a hundred years. Then we got into something more uh, inquisitive, more scientific. There was this catastrophism, uniformitarianism debate. I'm not going to go into this, but basically it disestablished the Bible's uh, history or Jewish story or Genesis. People started doing field work. They actually went out and looked at outcrops. They looked at rocks that were cross-cut, faulted, folded, and whatnot. And they very quickly disproved Noah's Ark flood. And then we had estimates for the age of Earth that rang from about 75,000 to several billion years, which is always a wild guess, but actually not pretty far off, as it turns out. And then about past 1850, we have the modern scientific era when we have modern chemistry and physics. And there's a few key dates here. In 1896, the discovery of radioactivity by a Frenchman. And as of about 1907, we used radiometric dating in various ways. Uh, there's that seminal <coughs> publication by Arthur Holmes. And then we used what is called chemical ages. And as of 1940, roughly, only about 70 years ago, the so-called isotope ages. And I'll show you in the next few minutes how that works. 
1953, 1956, two important papers by these gentlemen whose names I have printed there, we got the hard dates for the age of Earth that are valid to this day. So that is a historical backup, and you will see as we go along how that all fits together. So relative dating, that was for about 150 years what we did, and then the radiometric dating. How does that work? Let me show you what relative dating means. Here's sort of a hypothetical uh, block diagram of a geological area somewhere. There are sandstones, conglomerates, a batholith, this is the granite, faults. How does this come about? Geologist goes in there and tries to backstrip this in time. I'll do this forward and backward for you. Imagine, this is a little animation. Imagine we start at ground zero and the strata build up like this. One layer, another layer, another layer. Of course, everything on top of what is below is younger than the stuff below. So it builds up like this and then we have a bit of erosion. We have faulting there on the left side, a little more erosion, a little more deposition, more deposition. There's faulting on the right side, a little more erosion. Then we have what? Oh, now that magma comes in, makes a big blob of granite at depth, cross cuts the fault, a little more magma coming in, cross cuts the fault again, spreads out like this. There's more magma coming in from the left, makes what we call a dike, cross cuts everything that's older. So all these different layers, uh, still will these layers build me a different weather? <laughs> different weather, different kinds of rocks. Yeah. Okay? So we have now, what this composite picture, we have now an image of cross-cutting relationships. And basically, you know, take the batholith on the right side. It cross-cuts that fault. So clearly, the batholith must be younger than the fault. But what are the ages of these rocks? Are they a thousand years old, a million years old, a billion years old? Nobody knows. You need a clock. You need something to tell absolute ages. Enter radiometric data. And again, this is only 100 years that we've been able to do this. The basis of that is natural relativity, which is, or can be defined as isotopic changes via spontaneous emission of particles. Remember your high school chemistry. I'll give you one single element to illustrate the principle. This is carbon. Carbon, on the left of these three diagrams, that's the stable carbon isotope which has 12 protons and 12 neutrons. We count each one of them with a mass of one, so six of each makes 12 total. Then there's carbon-13, the one in the middle. It has an extra neutron. It's still carbon, but it has one more neutron in the belly, so to speak, with the electrons fizzing around. Both of these are stable. Then there's one on the right that has an extra, a second extra neutron. Now that's too much mass to handle, so now if you wish this element has flatulence, it's not happy. This, this extra carbon wants to get out, so that is an unstable isotope. And how does that happen? Well, somehow it comes out. That is radioactivity. When that unstable nucleus spontaneously decays, that's the lingo we use, to a stable nucleus. So one of these neutrons goes out and then we get either 13 or 14. That's the principle. Now, most radioactive elements or isotopes are quite heavy. They have a lot more than six of neutrons and protons in the belly. So here's sort of uranium, for example. And there are three types of decay. The one that was discovered in 1896 is the first one, alpha decay. So in that case, the element throws out the alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons. That is radioactivity. That's lethal radiation. You don't want to get too close to that. That destroys you and other living organisms. The other uh, kinds of decay I'm not going to get into right now. Just imagine the first one. Oh, we should talk about the second one also because there's something funny going on. A neutron emits an electron and morphs into a proton. There's something funky going on. The point is, in this process, the element changes. And many of these radioactive decays happen in multiple steps, sort of like it takes me 15 steps to go from here to that door. I can't just leap in one go. So here's uranium-238, which decays to thorium-234, and then it goes down to, yeah, as you can see there, to protactinium, and go on with 15 steps or so to lead 206, which is the stable final product. 
So that's the way it works in principle. That was discovered about 100 years ago, at least in principle, and all the details took another 10, 15, 20 years to work out. How fast does this happen? We need a clock. Well, for that, it gets rather mathematical, but I'm not going to bother with you this, but I show you the principal equation that you need to know. There's just one equation, the age equation. When you Google that word, you get what you've seen on the previous slide. There's four numbers in that equation that you see that are important. T is the age of the sample. D is the number of atoms of the daughter isotope. P is the number of atoms of the parent. And lambda is the so-called decay constant. And that is usually expressed in a different mathematical way as the half-life, which means the time after which half of the parent has decayed. Now, if that is too abstruse for you, let me show this to you in a graph. Then it becomes maybe easier to understand. Here we have the principal isotope decay curve as an exponential decay curve. I'm going to try to use the mouse here. I hope that shows. Yeah, it does. At time zero, that's here, we start out with a substance, that's this box, that has a certain number of parent isotopes. That's these black dots here. And after one time unit, doesn't matter what that time unit is, let's say it's 100 years, look what happened with my mouse. Five, 50 percent, half of these parents have decayed to daughters. The daughters are now in the red balls. You double the time, too, and then you take once again half of the parent and half them or convert them into daughters. So now we have, we have only these many, a, a quarter of the original parent left, and we have three quarters, and so on. That is the principle of the half-life. Every time you have a half-life passed, half of the original parent is gone, and then half of the remaining parent is gone, and so forth. So if you know what half-life is, what you do then is, let's say here, you analyze the ratio of the parent to the daughter, and then you have the age of the sample. That, in a nutshell, is the whole gizmo. That is how it works. I repeat, you analyze the ratio of the parent to the daughter, you must know the half-life, you get the age of the sample. And there's a whole bunch of isotopes that we can use. Here are from uh, standard geological textbooks the ones we normally use for rocks. Uranium-238 decays to lead-206. That's what you've seen earlier in that multiple step example. There's another uranium isotope we can use. There's thorium, there's rubidium, there's potassium. And I've added one that is very popular uh, for various reasons, carbon-14. Notice how long it takes how long the half-life is of these various isotopes. Four and a half billion years happens to be, coincidentally, the age of Earth. Seven or four million. Fourteen billion. That's as old as the universe. Forty-eight billion or fifty billion. That's older than the universe. It's possible. Why shouldn't it take longer than the old age of the universe? And then on the other end of the spectrum, carbon-14, only about five and a half thousand years. There are radioisotopes that decay in seconds, in fractions of seconds. They're very short -lived. We can't use them in geology, but if you Google half-lives, you go, you know, Wikipedia, you get a list of about 500 particles or isotopes that range from picoseconds to billions of years. Question mark. Which one of these should you use? Three criteria. Is the isotope of interest present in the material you want to analyze? For example, if you want to use uranium-238, that is common in a mineral called zircon, it's not there in feldspar, it's not there in gold, it's not there in diamond. So you have to decide, is that isotope even there? Is it absent or present? Suppose it is. Then you make another decision, that's this part here. How old is that sample roughly for you? to work with. So the example that I always use in my classes is stopwatch sundial. If you want to go to a sports event and there's a 100 meter dash, you don't go there with a the sundial. Obviously <laughs> not, because that is a completely useless tool for the purpose at hand. You use a stopwatch. Yeah. On the other hand, if you have something that, you know, oh, in the afternoon, let's meet at coffee mid-afternoon or so, uh, you know, you don't have a roller clock or whatever, a sundial. You just look with the sun, is that good enough? 
So in other words, the clock that you're using, in other words, the isotope you're using, depends roughly on how old the sample is. Short-lived things need a stopwatch, in other words, radiocarbon. Long-lived things need another isotopes for yeah. this purpose at hand. And just one thing, how do they prove it? I mean, you can't wait a billion years to have yourselves away for it to decay. May I suggest you wait with that question until we're done, and then we'll be happy to answer it. Okay. okay, good. And the third question that as radio, any, any scientist asks himself is, of course, how much is this going to cost me? And I'll come back to this in just a moment because you'll we'll see these are not cheap kinds of analyses. So how does that work in practice? In practice, geologist goes out there and gets a rock sample somewhere of whatever interest it may be. Carry it into the lab. And then you take a dental drill apparatus like this one and you drill out little pieces of that rock. And I've given you a particular rock here uh, from, uh, doesn't matter where it's from, it's a Permian oil field. The point is, I drilled out two particular samples. I drilled out some of this white stuff, a fairly large chunk, as you can see. And then I drilled out little pieces of in here. And I didn't get enough material to analyze from an individual thing. I'm not going to bore you with what that is. So I pooled 10 or 15 of these powders, put them in a little vial like this, and then I carry that into the lab. You get relatively crude spatial resolution. In other words, you take, but this thing is about 10, well, not quite, 6 centimeters wide, so you get fairly crude spatial resolution. You get extremely high accuracy. We get the best dates you can possibly imagine. And it's relatively cheap. We're talking about 150 bucks for each analysis. And then you go into a wet chemical lab, and you do all sorts of things, and I'm not going to explain how that works. And you basically dissolve the sample in acids and then uh, do some other things about them. And then, of course, you turn the light down. <laughs> and I use my radiometric vision. No, that's bullshit. That doesn't exist. Just because this is logic on and skeptical thinking, okay, don't you ever believe anyone tells you we can do this. No, nobody can do this. <laughs> But the sample, once it is in an acidified liquid form, goes into a lab. And then you have these good-looking guys there who are slaves to the machine that they have to babysit 24 hours a day. You ladies, if you ever want to marry a guy like this, he's never home. <laughs> he's not babysitting your children, he's babysitting that thing. Okay, I'm a different kind of a nerd, and that's also why I'm still single. That's another matter. <laughs> But these are expensive machines. They cost a million and a half or two million dollars and they need very specialized equipment or rather brains to run. And then you get the parent to the order ratio. But speaking of laser, we now have, this is about 20 years only, for the last 20 years, we have actually the possibility to analyze micro spots. Now look at the scale bar here, that's a millimeter. These are tiny little holes that have been burned into the samples with micro beams that are either lasers, yes, with laser guns, however, not with eyes, or iron beams, and then we basically vaporize a little bit of that sample. Now we get extremely high spatial resolution, the tiniest spots we can imagine, but they're not quite as accurate. The numbers have a larger error bar for those of you what that means. And these are now very expensive. Why? Because these are humongously expensive machines. They cost five to eight million dollars. We have one of those next door in the Earth Sciences building in the basement. Actually, it's in, in the bioscience, somewhere here in the, in the cellars. And again, there's highly qualified nerds running these machines. <laughs> so let's apply that. Let's assume in one of these two bins, basic you know, analytical methods, we get isotopic ratios parent to daughter and we know the lambda, in other words, we know how old that sample uh, should be depending on that ratio. I'll show you six or seven applications. Number one, dating of igneous rocks. Let's take lava that flows out somewhere and that picture at the bottom right there is from the famous Idaho basalts. Uh, if you've ever been along the Snake River in northern Idaho, there's miles and miles of these layers of lava. So what happens is what you're seeing in the top three diagrams. Here, this is the lava. There are radioactive atoms and stable atoms floating about. And then at some point, some crystals form and they're still floating. This thing gets kind of thicker and more viscous as it cools. 
And once it's cooled, you have this image on the right. Then you have the crystals all packed into a, if you wish, a three-dimensional uh, formation. And then at that moment, when the magma has solidified, or the lava solidified, then the isotopic clock starts ticking. Why? Look, these crystals here in the middle, they discriminate against those stable ones. They only, only incorporate the radioactive ones. So then that's the time, the solidification of the magma, when the clock starts ticking. And then you wait a while, and then you analyze the parent to donor ratio, and then you know how long ago that lava solidified. Application number one. You can do that with sedimentary rocks if there are certain minerals growing in that sedimentary rock after deposition. So here's an example of three valleys, if you wish. That's the North Saskatchewan River Valley. That's the Red Deer River uh, Valley around, well, Red right Deer, and that is the Bow River Valley in Calgary. And there would be similar kind of rocks that are cropping out in all three uh, orientations or places. And then you can kind of correlate them like this and put numbers on them if you find something in there, in that rock, that is dateable. Remember, absence or presence. Sometimes there's nothing you can date. Well, then you're on a lot with this method. Application 2B is very young materials. I want to make this point because uh, we'll come back to radiocarbon in a moment. That is this isotope with a very short, relatively speaking, five and a half thousand years, very short half-life. We use this to date organic materials that are quite young. How does that work? Well, here there's all sorts of cosmic, cosmic bombardment with helium in, uh, up in the stratosphere. It makes nitrogen-14, which makes carbon-14, that makes CO2. That CO2 winds up in the leaves, in the trunks. It winds up in the bellies of the animals, in other words, in the bones and in the organic matter. And once they die, this is what you see on the right, some of that material winds up getting embedded in the soil. And that's when the radio isotope clock starts ticking, because there's no more carbon-14 coming in from the moment of death. So what we then date is basically the moment of death of whatever plant or animal that was. But it only works in a short period of time. Look at this decay curve here. You see, after about 17,000 years, you're down to 10% of the original radiocarbon. You can easily imagine, well, 50,000 years, and this method becomes useless. Why? Because all the carbon-14 is gone. It decayed so fast, there's nothing left to measure. So this method has a very short, that's the stopwatch, right? It has a very short application. We can now put numbers on this kind of a volume that I've shown you a little bit earlier. We could only guess, yeah, we know what was younger and older, but we can only guess how fast that all happened. Now we can put numbers on it. And what we, what we normally take is the igneous material, because that's the most obvious containing um, the radioisotopes. So the batholith gives us a good age, and these sills and dikes give us good ages that are also magnetic. Application four is the calibration of geologic time. This is, of course, Arthur Holmes' book, basically. Uh, we have this whole geological uh, column, if you wish, for another 150 years. We have had that for a long time. We knew that the Cambrian is older than the Ordovician, than the Silurian, than the Devonian. But this is all just relative ages. Nobody could put numbers on that scale bar until about well, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Now we know that, well, this boundary is 505, 505 million years ago or 400 and something million years ago. That also explains to you why these geologic periods have unequal length. This is not sort of like, you know, one million years or 10 million years each. They have haphazard duration because when these boundaries were established, we had no clock. We had no isotopic clock, no we didn't. Oh, and by the way, the age of Earth is determined by the oldest age we find in meteorites. Because meteorites is what made Earth, right? There's billions of meteorites. They just slam together and this planet gets bigger and bigger. Earth is an agglomeration of meteorites, just like the body is an agglomeration of microbes. There's an interesting analogy for you. <laughs> <laughs> Application 5 is, of course, to trace the Earth through time. And I want to do this in a very quick way by looking at plates or plate boundary motions. This is an image reconstructed from what we know of the late Cambrian. It's about 510 million years ago. Laurentia is in ancestral North America. At the time, so the North Pole 
today is about here, was right on the equator at the time and pointing this way. And this would be sort of Mexico by today's standards. But look, this looked completely alien. The, content, the continents were much smaller back then, and they were in different places. If I flip through these 500 million years in a relatively fast way, well, how do we do that? You do the careful relative dating, and you calibrate that with the radiometric dates. And then you get this kind of a succession of events and wind up at today. This was not possible a hundred years ago, and barely possible a hundred years ago. And this is why, in a way, you can't fault people who, you know, 200 or 300 years ago thought, oh, the Earth is maybe only 75,000 years old. They had nothing to go by. Well, now we do. And in the oceans, that is also very important in this context, we can date something else. I've shown you just the continents in the previous series. In the oceans, if you take the water out here between Africa and North America, you wind up finding this gigantic mountain range which is segmented into these slivers. And when you look at them sideways, it turns out that they actually they have parallel stripes that have been or were discovered in the 1960s with magnetic surveying. So there was a ship called the Global Challenger that crisscrossed the ocean, uh, in particularly the North Atlantic. And sort of, if you imagine that boat goes back and forth like so, it finds these magnetic stripes. And they showed us, for the first time, very clearly, what really happened. The magma comes up here along that so-called spreading center and pushes these slabs out sideways. And every one of these uh, uh, colored stripes here is, is a magmatic event. And we can date them with radiometric ages. And so we know now that the North Atlantic is about 210, 220 billion years old from one end to the other. And that's it. And before that, there was no Atlantic. That was Pangaea. And of course, this is used also for the reconstruction of life through time. So here's again the geologic timetable and just two or three things maybe to highlight. Jawless fishes came up in the Cambrian. Bony fishes came up in the Silurian. Amphibians, no amphibians before the Devonian Mississippian. Here's the age of the dinosaurs, as we commonly call it, dated clearly between 250, 60 sites. And where the humans? The humans are that very, very recent afterthought. Again, before that, biblical story, the ancient, you know, Greek philosophers, 6,000 years now. But I want to spend a little more time, another minute or two, on the story of the hominidae, the human uh, evolution, because it is so prevalent in society in various ways. This is a time bar over the last seven million years, and that shows you the major steps in the dominant evolution. Humans, as we call them, are really only these here, Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, and you see sort of reconstructions of them. How do we know that? Well, this is fossil evidence, obviously. How we how do you know that Australopithecus afarensis is or was living in this time interval? Well, you go to the fossil site. This happens to be in Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Eastern Africa in general. And here, for example, there's the evidence. There's a razor sharp ash layer. They are the best things we can find. They're razor sharp. You put a volcanic eruption. That's a the very thin ash layer, dated at 3.1. 8 million years, and you date the next ash layer, and basically you fence in the fossil finds between the ash layers. So, no, not 6,000 years, 10,000, no, no, we were talking 3 million years for that particular fossil. You tell that to the creationists, and you know, we just had a little discussion like that in the hallway. Uh, they are, most of these people are closed minded. It just doesn't matter what you show them, whether it's fossil evidence, radiometric dating, either they don't understand it or they don't even listen to you. Uh, frankly, I don't argue with these people anymore. I did this 20 years ago. I'm not wasting my breath <laughs> with these kinds of people. Nevertheless, just you know, for added entertainment, uh, if you want to go there, there is a creationist science museum or whatever it calls itself, not too far from here. This is two hours by car towards the all places drop ever. And you find uh, you know evidence or if you not like this place on dinosaurs and humans and you find <laughs> you know, they look at the same time. Now look at the bottom part, this is particularly interesting. There's a guy who has a velociraptor for a <laughs> And these people really believe that. They 
how can you argue with somebody who believes this? I, I don't. I just don't. I just, you don't find fairy tale if you want to believe in the Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and into this. That's fine with me. So, if you make a trip to that museum, I suggest don't you know smile and watch. And it's in, they also have a fossilized cowboy boot. I'm not kidding you. And other things like this in there. I went once for entertainment, but I didn't argue. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, this is what I included in my abstract, uh, and I want to make the point uh, very explicitly, uh, these methods that I've described to you cannot only be used in geologic materials, we can also use them in archaeological artifacts, particularly, of course, carbon-14, again, the isotopic stopwatch. And the most famous example, this is not the only one, but the most famous example you will find is, of course, the Shroud of Turin, uh, which has been touted uh, by many people to be, yeah, well, an image of Jesus. Well, the thing turns out to be Middle Age. It was dated by three first-class radioisotope labs in the world as blind tests. One of them was Zurich, Arizona, and Oxford. They didn't know what the other labs were doing, and even the Vatican agreed to the analyses and wanting to accept them whenever they come back. So this was a perfect scientific case. And all the labs came up with the same age range. So this thing is not Jesus Shroud, whoever that individual was. Well, I don't envy him for getting nailed to the cross and all that, but it's not or well, wasn't Jesus. So now you know how it works, and now you know why it matters. Thank you for your attendance. Very rarely, yeah. These so-called diagenetic minerals, 
plants that grow in sedimentary rocks, apatite would be one of them. And sometimes you have clay minerals. Uh, you obviously know a little bit about mineralogy, so the phyllosilicates like biotite, muscovite, illite, coldenite, if they grow in the rock, they contain potassium and then you can do potassium argon with them. Over here. Uh, how do you really compensate for the, I guess, naturally occurring daughter elements? So we're talking about uranium to lead, there was probably lead there before. So how do you deal with that? I left that out. <laughs> If you remember that slide I showed, I can probably even just go back to it. No, don't be sorry. I, I'm, I'm delighted that you're asking a question of that caliber. It's just that, you know, I knew I had 30 minutes. And I didn't want to get into every detail. There. See, what, what, I, what I said here, and this is obviously an oversimplification, is that the mineral that grows there right now discriminates against these stabilizing tools that are in that the light purple balls. At the same token, what I've made an, as an implicit assumption is that this mineral also discriminates against the dot. So if, for example, that is uranium, those blue dots, and there's already a little bit of lead in the mineral, in, in the magma, then I have to make an assumption, oh, there's probably so little lead, it doesn't matter. In other words, you have to make assumptions. And the only time when you can really put numbers on that is with meteorites. When you put meteorite ages on it, you know what you basically do is you look at the various lead isotopes because they're stable and radiogenic as they derive from radiogenic decay lead isotopes, right? Lead has three isotopes, 204, 205, 207, actually there's no one, 208. So you look at the various lead isotope ratios and that's how you discriminate against how much lead there was to be. Sorry, it was an involved answer, but that's why I left it out. <laughs> Good questions. I'll be happy to answer them if I can handle them. Mark. Um, for organic material, as of the moment of death, how long does it take for the crystallization process to complete such that you can, you know, say at this point um, there's the 100% to 0% ratio? There isn't really a crystallization process. Imagine the plant is, well, like all the trees right now, they're budding. They're taking up carbon dioxide as we speak. At this moment, every leaf has the C14 so to C14. Test uh, detonations, then there was way more radiogenic carbon in the atmosphere, and we can actually measure that in the plants that grew at the time. So that aside, Let's you know, assume we don't have nuclear bombs to worry about. Uh, there's a certain carbon 14 to 12 ratio right now in the atmosphere. The plant picks that up. And the plant, like almost every cell in our body, they renew their cells continuously in equilibrium with the atmosphere of CO2. The moment you die, that isotopic exchange stops. Your cells, the plant cells, stop rejuvenating. And that means at that moment the clock starts ticking. So it has nothing to do with fossilization. The, that ratio is as of the moment of death. The moment of death of the original plant material, wood, for example, or bone. <coughs> I should even ask you guys, do you even know what your bones consist of? <laughs> Calcium? No. <laughs> I ask my students every year, in, in the 20 years I've been here, it's never been a single student who knew, who knew what the actual material, the mineral is of the bone or the teeth. It's similar to appetite. It is appetite, yeah, basically. It's Arthur. a calcium phosphate. It's a calcium phosphate. It's a form of a calcium hydroxyl appetite. Your dad's a dentist, right? No. No, but <laughs> I had one student in 20 years who knew, but only because his dad was a dentist. I think that's shameful. You know, I'm always kind of pushing my students a little bit and kind of embarrass them and encourage them at the same time. How can you walk around and be 22 years old you don't even know what your teeth made of? It looks my mind. People don't ask enough, enough questions about the surrounding environment. So that's just a little sidetrack. How did I get into this? There was an on there. Go ahead. Yeah, how about how old something brought me 
I would say, that most, most people, if you have actually, because, okay, I'll give you a variety, a slightly, slightly spongy answer. <laughs> 20 years ago, 50,000 years. And, and in a way, I'm, I'm happy that you're making this, uh, or asking this question because it makes another point. Over the last 30 years, the analytical geochemistry has gotten extremely advanced. In other words, we can analyze small and small amounts we used to be able to analyze only down to the ppm level, parts per minute. Then we used to be able, now we can analyze down to the PBB level, which is another three orders of magnitude less. In other words, once you can analyze small and small amounts, you are stretching the possibility of dating. So in other words, 20 years ago, I would have said 50,000 years is the most we can date with radiocarbon. Now we can go to 70 or 75,000 years. Not because anything has changed in the radiochemistry. Our analytical accuracy or precision has increased. We can analyze much smaller amounts. And following up, um, you're looking at the lobe of it, um, how young something is at this How young? Yeah. Well, it's, that depends on, uh, a good question again, that depends on the, on the lambda, on the half-life. Okay. So imagine, again, just think in extremes and it's easy. Imagine you have a, a rock, and the only thing you can use is uranium lead dating. We're talking, what was the half-life again? We're talking several hundred million years, depending on which isotope. Where was that? Here? There. So take, take an isotope here, uranium lead, with four and a half billion years. Now imagine you make a crystal that has only uranium in it, and no lead and you wait a hundred million years or only a hundred thousand years it's a lot of time for us trilogy a hundred thousand years that's chicken shit <laughs> <laughs> so you wait a hundred thousand years there is so little lead form that you can't even measure it because it still takes so damn long time right? on the other hand, take the other extreme let's say you have an isotope with a half-life of one hour one hour you make that compound, you wait five seconds and you have enough water product to measure. Right? See, whenever you, you ask a question like this, it's a good question. You take the two extremes and it becomes obvious. So the answer to your question is, it depends on the half-life. Yeah? So along the same line, is, is there a gap of time or a certain period where we say, well, we don't really have a substance that can accurately measure, or do we have the range? We have a range. I've never met any isotope geochemist, these kinds of nerds who do this day night, you know, I'm not one of them. I'm a different kind of nerd. But these kinds of guys who do this all the time, I've never met one who says we can't take this. No, there's always some isotope we can use. The problem is more, is it there? Right? You may have a substance, somebody comes into the lab and says, I don't know what it is, you know, maybe a sample of gold. That, just to take a really stupid example, gold or diamond. You want to know how old this is. There's no way you can do that with radioisotopes because there's nothing in the gold that can measure. Mind you, the diamond might have something in it. You'll be amazed what you can do with diamonds. Lots of diamonds have tiny little impurities in them, maybe a bit of garnet or some other kind of a mineral, tiny little speck. That thing can be dated. Not the diamond itself, that's just pure carbon. But the little inclusion may have just enough uranium in it, just enough potassium in it that you can date it. That's how we date diamonds. Not with the actual diamond, but with the tiny little inclusions in them. But gold is hopeless. Lots of minerals are just hopeless. You can't date them. You find something in the rock that is dateable, if you're lucky. So this absent present thing that's really important. And not to forget the cost. You know, I mean, this is expensive. This gigantic machine there, you pay a thousand bucks. 1200 bucks for one single analysis. Who's got that kind of money? Yes? If you have some rocks which are uh, buried near uranium or something, would you have to uh, adjust the half-life to account for neutron activation or something? Yeah. Yeah, if you're absolutely right. If, you have, if you're next to rocks that radiate, then you have to correct for this. Active rather involved. 
I'll be happy to give you literature on this if you really know. And the, the, again, I, I was making reference to that centennial earlier. The, the, this is a magazine that comes out once a month. It's called Elements. It's a highly technical geochemical journal. The February issue of this year has six or seven articles. The whole issue is dedicated to the centennial of geochronology. Yeah, the answers to the questions you're posing are in there. If you, if you want to, I'll be happy to give you that issue. It's an involved question. I don't try to weasel out, but it's an involved question. It would take a little more than two sentences to answer. Well, if you're, I, I'm, really, I'm really impressed that you guys are so alert and eager and whatnot. You all, there was a talk earlier today about how to become a nerd. <laughs> who, who gave that talk? This guy did his mission. He, is, is he here? You succeeded. <laughs> these, these guys are already know the best way to become nerds. So I don't want to do the you know, final concluding remarks here, but as I understand it, there's still a draw for something or whatever. So I'll hand the microphone over to Sean. Sure. Sure.